Farren Folche, Fear Queen, Royal Galair. I'm Margaret Kelleher, Chair of Anglo Irish Literature and Drama at University College Dublin, and I'm a board member of the Museum of Literature Ireland, a collaboration between the National Library of Ireland and UCD, located at St. Stephen's Green. Since our opening in September 2019, and in in the years prior to that, in Molly's gestation, the support of the Department of Foreign Affairs has been greatly appreciated. We can see tangible results of that already in our beautiful Bloomsday films, the three poems for Bridget, and also some landmark exhibitions. And there are a number of exciting collaborations ahead. This tonight is a volume that celebrates 100 years and I'd like to begin by mentioning two dates that for me mark the rich collaboration between the literary sphere and the Department of Foreign Affairs. The first is a personal one. In 1966, my chair, the Chair of Anglo-Irish Literature, was founded the first of its kind in the world. And its aim was to recognise the distinctiveness of Irish literature as a separate tradition the role of our Foreign Service in ensuring the global recognition of that, of course, preceded that date in 1966 and continues on today. A second date I'd like to mention is that of Yeats's Nobel Prize, given in 1923, as he said himself, less for me than for my country, it is Europe's welcome to the free state. Almost 100 years later, the contributors to this volume and so many of you in the audience tonight are continuing through your work to foster creativity, to share the work of creative practitioners with international audiences, to link our writers with foreign publishers and crucially to enable translations of their work. And I'd like to express my sincere thanks to you and on behalf of Molly and the wider cultural sphere for the work that you continue to do. In this volume and in this evening, of course, we're turning the tables. We're celebrating the creativity of Foreign Service members and of their families, some very well known and some fantastic new discoveries. So to begin the evening formally, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Joe Hackett, Department of Foreign Affairs, Secretary General. Uh, good evening, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's launch event, kindly hosted by our very good partners here in the Museum of Literature Ireland. And Margaret, thank you very much for your thoughtful and generous introductory words. All Strangers Here forms part of our department's centenary programme and explores the rich interrelationship of diplomacy, of creativity and language through a selection of poetry and prose by Irish diplomats and their families since 1919. The arts of diplomacy, of public service and writing are close companions. Both appreciate the importance of words, and the necessity of imagination. Writers, civil servants are in no way unique to Ireland, and yet this anthology is the first of its kind globally. This evening, we look forward to conversation and readings with authors featured in the volume, alongside a, a series of short readings filmed by our colleagues in Paris, in New York, in Stockholm, and here in Dublin. And we hope this gives a flavor of the breadth of the book, and its wider social and historical, as well as literary, interests. Importantly, this book reflects the work not just of women and men employed by the Department of Foreign Affairs, but also their partners and children who accompanied them on posting Ireland's extended diplomatic service. The title, All Strangers Here, is evocative of the constant cycle of displacement and return that characterizes life in the department. And we hope that this selection of work will take readers behind the scenes and provide a glimpse between the lines of history. I want to thank a trio of current department officials who edited this volume, Angela Byrne, Ragnar Dini Almquist, and Helena Nolan, along with Eugene Downs and our cultural team who managed the project over the last three years, and also to acknowledge the leadership and vision of my predecessor, Niall Burgess. 
Thanks also to the many current and retired colleagues and the families of departed colleagues who generously agreed to have their work included. I think putting words of poetry or prose on a page can be a moment of self-revelation, of vulnerability and authenticity. It takes courage and empathy to do so. And these are two qualities that have long defined Irish foreign policy. I am pleased, therefore, to acknowledge the creativity and dedication of generations of Irish public servants and their families who have served Ireland through the first century of independence. Thank you. on RTE Radio 1 and I'm thrilled to be here tonight uh, for the launch. Um, I'm going to introduce my guest first of all uh, and have a chat with him. He is the former uh, Department of Foreign Affairs Secretary General Niall Burgess. Niall, uh, good evening and welcome. Good evening, thank you. In the introduction to the book you talk about how the idea for this came out of a winter's night in a Dublin pub. Tell me about that night. Well it began as a uh, a conversation <coughs> with a few friends uh, about the writers we've known and the writers in the department who've preceded us. And it was really a recital of writing that we've taken pleasure in over the course of our careers. And then the idea emerged that it would be a really interesting exercise to begin to collect some of this work, to pull it together. Um, but there are a lot of bright ideas that emerge in Dublin pubs on winter's evenings. Uh, what was different in this case was that that trio uh, that Joe Hackett just mentioned, uh, Angela, Ragnar and Helena, really took that up uh, as a cause and ably supported by Eugene Downs and Eilish Nidivna. And what surprises me is that when they cast their net they came up with a hole that was far, far richer, I think, than any of us had expected. Maybe tell us a little bit about that as well, because even from me, from when I got my copy of this book, the breadth of people that are, are represented here, some names very well known, some names slightly less well known. Tell us a little bit about that breadth of talent. Well, look, I think, I think what's really important about this book for me is that there are fine writers who've passed through the department whose work hasn't yet been recognised. Uh, their work may be as public servants or civil servants as well recognised, but their creative writing, that part of the hinterland within the department, hasn't really been brought to print in this way before. And in a way, I think in, in talking about the Department of Foreign Affairs here, we're really only talking about the tip of the iceberg because we're talking about a phenomenon that has been characteristic right across the civil service. You know, if you take a point in time, if you take the 1960s, even before you talk about the Department of External Affairs as it then was, you have Thomas Kinsler working in the Department of Finance, you have Dennis O'Driscoll working in the Revenue Commissioners, Marcin O'Dearoyne in the Department of Education, you have Richard Power in the Department of Local Government finishing a masterful novel, The Hungry Grass, sitting at a desk which Brian O'Nolan had occupied beforehand. And that's just one moment in time. And you'll find that right up to the present, that the, the, Irish, the Irish Civil Service has, has sheltered a lot of fine writers, but public service in Ireland has benefited to a remarkable degree from their writing skills too. I'm, I'm interested in something you said in the introduction of the book as well. Uh, you mentioned that some of the most important and influential texts aren't in this anthology. Tell us uh, about those texts as well. Well, I think what I was referring to there is the, is the daytime part of our work. You know, the, the, the very word diplomacy uh, comes from the Greek word for a letter. A diplomat is a courier of letters, a courier of words. And I think that some of the finest work that's been done over the past hundred years in the Department of Foreign Affairs has been work on texts which have been profoundly influential in our own lives and in our own society. And I think, for example, that the word craft and the thoughtfulness and the, the consideration given to words that went into the Downing Street Declaration, the Good Friday Agreement, the, you know, the, the, the fundamental texts of our own peace process are another element of this skill with words. 
And I think that continues to this very day. I mean, every day we have a team working in New York at the United Nations on the UN Security Council dealing with profoundly important issues where words matter. Because words can, words can create a bridge, they can span a difference, they can create a connection, and at their very best they can inspire those who read them to more. And that to me is the work of the Department of Foreign Affairs at its very finest. What this shows is the, the care for and respect for words and the waiting of words that you see in the private lives and the private work of officials and their family members who've been a part of the department over that century. Perhaps just before uh, you and I finish, you might tell us a little bit about those writers and those items that you found in the book that you liked most yourself. Well, I mean, I, 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 I would pick out one simply because he's a writer that I think is, is, is at risk of being overlooked. Um, and I'm going back to the very origins of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, for me, Daniel Binchy wrote some of the most to Germany. He presented his credentials as a young 30-year-old. And I think in, in Binchy, you can see the, 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 the thoughtfulness and the analysis that went into his work in some of his official work, as much as in the work that, that, that's, that's uh, captured in this book here. And, you know, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the words themselves that matter. It's what lies behind the words. It's the thought, the analysis, um, the understanding of human nature uh, that underpins them. And in, in, in one of his comments from Berlin, uh, Binchy spoke about um, about Adolf Hitler, he said, there are only two barriers to megalomania in public life, intelligence and a sense of humour. Either of these qualities would suffice to prevent it, but I believe Hitler to be lacking in both. And I think there's remarkable insight there. There's also in Binchy, there's quite a, an extraordinary humility and self-awareness as well. He tells a lot of stories against himself at one point, he speaks about how when he was a student, he dismissed Hitler as a lunatic with a talent for oratory. And he said, he really reports somebody is saying to him, anybody who has a talent for oratory is far from harmless. Um, and at one point in his cables, he says, the smaller and more unimportant a country which a minister represents, the more conscious he is of his great dignity. I think there's great insight into human nature there. Niall Burgess, the former Secretary General of the Department of Foreign Affairs, thank you for joining us this evening. We're going to continue now with uh, the first of our videos for tonight. It is Maeve Higgins in New York reading A Daydream by the wonderful Maeve Brennan. This is a daydream. I am lying in the sand just below the dunes on the beach in East Hampton, where I lived for several years. It is a warm, sunless day with a cool wind blowing in from the ocean. My eyes are closed. I like the beach and the sand. There is a big Turkish towel between me and the sand and I am quite alone. The cats and my dog Bluebell walked over here with me but two of the cats dropped out at the walled rose garden a short distance back and the four others are hiding in the long dune grass just above me. Bluebell is down by the water. She is a black Labrador retriever and she swims and rolls in the water and watches for a seagull to play with. But the gulls fly off, shrieking with outrage at the sight of her. I can't stay here much longer. In a few minutes, I'll get up and start for home. A five minute walk through dune grass and between trees and across the wide sloping lawn that leads to the big house where the walled rose garden is. I live at the foot of that lawn. I'll just lie here a few more minutes and then I'll go back. But I opened my eyes too suddenly for no reason at all. 
and the beach at East Hampton had vanished along with Bluebell and the cats, all of them dead for years now. The Turkish towel is, in reality, the nubbly white counterpane of the bed I'm lying on, and the cool ocean breeze is being provided by the blessed air conditioner. It is 93 degrees. It's a terrible day in New York City. So much for the daydream of sand and sea and roses. The daydream was, after all, only a mild attack of homesickness. The reason it was a mild attack instead of a fierce one is that there are a number of places I am homesick for. East Hampton is only one of them. And May Brennan being one of the extended uh, diplomatic family that we were talking about uh, a little bit earlier. Our panel for tonight, for the rest of the event, uh, includes Richard Ryan. Uh, during his posting to London, he was a contributor to the negotiations for the Anglo-Irish Agreement. He's been the Irish ambassador to Korea, Spain, Algeria, Tunisia, the Netherlands, the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the Czech Republic and Ukraine, as well as Irish ambassador to the United Nations. Siobhan Campbell is widely published and anthologised. She was a recipient of the Oxford Brooks International Prize in 2016 and with Nessa O'Mahony, the editor of Ivan Boland's uh, History. Uh, she's on the faculty of the Open University and her fourth collection, Heat Signature, uh, is out. Uh, and as well as that, uh, one of the editors uh, is joining us here tonight as well, Angela Byrne. Uh, Angela is the cultural officer in the Department of Foreign Affairs, previously an historian and the writer of books on the history of Irish migration and women's history. Thank you all so much for joining us here in the Museum of Literature Ireland uh, tonight. Richard, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm going to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about that extraordinarily illustrious career in the Department of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Rick, and good evening. Uh, before I was even properly aware that there was a Department of Foreign Affairs, the only thing I really cared about was poetry. And after a few years uh, in teaching in universities in America and here, I was tapped on the shoulder by uh, an old friend, he was much older than me, I mean, and he lured me in the direction of the department, and here I am. Um, you mentioned us on the Security Council, which we are now, of course, ending our first year of two, and I was there 20 years ago, 2001, two. And as I was trying to write poetry, I had a wonderful mentor in John Montague, really so supportive and very valuable to me. And it was he who first mentioned the connection, as he saw it, between poetry, diplomacy, and poetry. And going back to 20 years ago, uh, as we came toward the end of a very, very uh, exciting two years, uh, my wife Hian and I gave a dinner in honor of the Secretary General Kofi Annan and his wife Nan, and to thank him and for all the ways in which we had tried to do things together, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. That's the way it is. And I had guests, including uh, Sergei Lavrov, then ambassador to the UN, Russian, uh, now the longtime uh, foreign minister of Russia, there was the Egyptian ambassador, Ahmed Abulgate, uh, later foreign minister, and I think he's still the Secretary General of the Arab League. But I should have said regarding Sergei Lavrov, it's not widely known, I think, that he's actually a very talented poet. So there's one. So it's, uh, it's something that doesn't just happen within our, our own uh, department of foreign affairs? No, it's something possible. that happens inside people, wherever they are. Uh, anyway, Abulgate uh, was also a great lover of poetry, and there were others there. Uh, now, on the morning of that dinner, I got a phone call from Seamus Heaney, who was coming into New York that afternoon, and it was his custom uh, with Mary to stay with us, uh, uh, laying over, as he, used to call, as he used to call it. And during the day, I had a thought 
on the long the lines of interested senior diplomatic people, very interesting people, uh, and shame is coming at the same time. So I, I had an instinct and I acted on it, and I asked Seamus, would he read a poem after the dinner? And what I had chosen was a long meditation by the great uh, Scottish Gaelic poet, Soyla Machelain, in a poem called Halig, which is concerned, a sustained reflection on the mid 18th century onward highland clearances. There's an image in it, for example, of birches coming down a hillside. And they are the girls who are going toward the ships for Canada. It's that sort of thing and meditation. So he agreed, and I informed everybody around the table, and it's a long poem, but wonderful, simply wonderful. And as he read it, everybody stopped moving, literally, except Seamus's finger, which was, if you like, conducting his own voice and music. It was tremendous, and I have always looked back on it, because here were people, ambassadors of calibre, who would flinch at nothing, who were capable of doing anything in the national interest, whatever it might be, uh, and so on. Uh, and, but there they were, absolutely taking in this wonderful thing. I mean, they had been, these ambassadors had been dealing, and their countries, with all kinds of horrors, the movements of people, all kinds of things that don't easily seem to fit into a day's work. But here they were, and they were so devoted, and colleagues during those two years that we were on the council, working almost every day together. The skill that they used in language, in approach, in dropping a word or dropping a flavor, or a taste even, this is what it, what it becomes at that sort of level. I've always recalled it, and I think Montague was absolutely right. There is something to do with language, with personality, with presentation, and with invoking trust, if you can do it. Trust and friendship, and to have your word taken, if possible. I mean, if diplomacy is, you want to take someone from someone else, that person doesn't want to give it to you, but in getting it from that person, you make that person feel that they're winning by the exchange. That's a very simple, simplified version of Henry Wotton, the Elizabethan diplomat and poet, uh, I think put it in those terms. So there you are. That's my feel by, by a parable or an example, if you like, of how I, I experienced it. You're going to read uh, a little something for us now that's included in uh, the anthology. What are you going to read? Yes. Before I heard about the department, I was in my early 20s and I was invited to go to American University to teach and did a year at that. But winter was coming on in Minnesota, where I was, and I was alone. And a very early poem, I have to insist, came out of it. It's called Winter in Minneapolis. From my high window, I can watch the freeways coiling on their strange stilts to where the city glows through rain like a new planet. Tonight, the radio speaks of snow, and in the waste plots below, trees stiffen, frost wrinkles the pools. Through high, dark air, the apartment buildings, like computer panels, begin again to transmit their faint signals. For they are there now, freed one and all from the far, windy towns, the thin, bright girls compounded of heat, movement, and a few portable needs. But I have no calls to make tonight, for we are all strangers here who have only the night to share. Stereos, soft lights, and small alarm clocks. Of our photograph albums, our far towns, and our silences, we do not speak. Wisely, we've learned to respect the locked door and an answered telephone. I turn from my window and pause a moment in darkness. 
my bed and desk barely visible, clean paper weights in its neat circle of light. I wait, and slowly they appear, singly like apparitions. They stand all round me on metal bridges and in the wet streets, their long hair blowing, and they will not go. I think in the absence of an audience, we have to do this because there are, there are enough of us here. In, unfortunately, in the absence of, 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 of a live audience, there are enough of us here to, 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 to give that round of applause. Uh, how did you feel when you realised that it was some of your own words that were being used to title this anthology? Well, I, do, I don't know how it happened, but I suppose somebody... That was the poem that I've just read out that has that little, a few words. Um, it, I think it carries the fact that we're all, we all have our privacies, we all have our internal lives, our families, our backgrounds, and we meet according to well-laid-out plans in strange parts of the earth, uh, cities, and make all kinds of contacts and friends, doing the best we can for our country. But we are all alone here. I think, I, think, I hope it is felt that it captures something of it. Siobhan, there are writings obviously from many people who over the years have been part of the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs. There are also then many writings in this anthology from people who are part of what, if you'd like to call the greater diplomatic family, and you're one of those people. Um, tell us maybe a little bit about yourself and about your work and then how you came to end up uh, as part of this. Righto. Um, well, I've been writing poetry for many years, um, like a lot of people in Ireland, was first published by D David Marcus in the Irish press, in New Irish Writing. <coughs> so I uh, met my then-to-be diplomat husband at, at UCD, and I pursued poetry all, all the way through um, an English degree and on, on into a master's, while working then in book publishing. Very, very hard work, very low-paid hard work, but uh, hard graft in terms of craft, uh, craft, helping others craft their language. And that's, I suppose, what links everything in this book is that reverence for language um, that, that Richard has mentioned. Um, and the connections made in this book are through, in a way, that narratives, stories, ways of describing things, that these things are the things that link us, you know. So as, as a poet, I have obviously valued all that um, all, all the way through, and I'm currently teaching creative writing and English literature at the Open University. Um, poetry, as you know, makes no money, so it keeps us honest, but we have to have a day job. Um, but the great thing about the peripatetic life is poetry needs very little. There's no accoutrements. It's, um, as Bobby McDonough says in this book, it's, in terms of negotiations, it's what people bring to the table themselves and the ideas. Well, it's the same in poetry. It's about people, it's about lived lives, and it's about ideas. Um, and therefore, I'm portable, so I can be <laughs> shunted across the world. Um, but the great thing about the, the diplomatic life, um, although it has huge challenges, it also has uh, huge advantages. Doors are opened for you, you're welcomed into a new culture. And that feeds, of course, in, into the writing. And you can see that right across this book as well. I, I'm going to ask you about that because Richard has talked a little bit about what being a diplomat brings to, to his writing. It, it, what does that life then bring to your writing and what has it done so over the years? And does it vary from location to location from where you are? How, how does that work for you? Yeah, I think you're, you're uh, putting your finger on it there. It does vary from location to location. Um, everywhere you go, to some extent, you're reinventing yourself. You're finding out how to be in, in the new culture. Um, being a writer, I obviously seek out the, the writers and the writers groups and the, the literary scene. And um, I have to say people are very generous. Um, I, I think the Irish card is the card to play um, when we're on the, the world stage. Um, and we know in diplomacy, obviously, as a small country, we, we punch way above our weight. But just in terms of literary uh, endeavours too, we, we, we do that. So I have uh, found the different places, whether that be San Francisco, Washington DC, London, um, currently in Belfast, um, all to be very different. But nonetheless, um, that sort of door opening that, that poetry can do, it seems to disarm people, you know. Um, and I've been w welcomed in. 
um, and I'm very grateful for those friendships, those literary friendships along the way. You are as well going to read us uh, a little something that is included in uh, the anthology. What have you got? Yes, I'm, I'm going to read this poem and I'd like to dedicate it um, to all those diplomats who worked so hard on the Anglo-Irish Agreement and um, I'm lucky enough that this poem was used in the um, 20th uh, anniversary celebrations of, of the Good Friday Agreement in the uh, poetry and music event called In Dreams Become Responsibilities. When all this is over, I plan to go north by unapproved roads where sniper signs rust on the trees. I will cross the border over and back several times to see how it feels. I will dance the pig's dyke and taste mountain mayflower on the breeze. Near underfished lakes, I will hear a blood pause in the reach of the night when every word used for batter and crisis will cruise with the ease of what runs right through us. When the shift and fill of my own dear selves is all they will tell as they breathe. And out through the lanes, I will lie in my form in overgrown fields, not a chopper in sight. And they say it is safe and the weather agrees. And again, one more time. Thank you, uh, Siobhan. Before I, I talk to one of the editors uh, of the collection, we're going to have some more video clips and just take a break for a moment. And the first of those starts in Stockholm. No one should go back to the old places. Too many one knew are dead. Old, slow, remembered customs gone with them. And the streets, besides, seem narrower in any event. The green tidied up by the municipal council. The rough fields covered by semi-detached but tiny gardens. The teeming tumultuous sea, pushed further back by a new wall. All disturbing elements pretty nearly accounted for including a last regret, which at any time is irrelevant. All that newlywed hope, shotguns fired from a balcony, like stepping 10 years into the future, moving forward a generation. The best part going through customs at the airport this is for all your adventures. They were so young and they knew nothing. My mother scared because I didn't laugh enough. Too quiet, too deeply buried in winter. The past is just another disguise. I don't recognize myself. Scrub. Scrub sprungi, dorsha ik agalev, bolle shan alish un ugeye erendalev. She nared she bugger, hula shisha, belg sasusa, shuska in san liena, flas bogon echter. Is han ik dale, duv, firin, ik bulleger harantilal, ma hrain ik togoil rehima. The Rochuin Fenig, Vig and Tosta Bagon. Huigan Lampadarag, a glam rig, Lusk and Fogra Rawig in a Hurveru de Rossach, Nurhuigan Kaffa, Firin and Order of Forty. Clean canopy telga her, she's sheep and a gala, clitter clatter low and eha, slupper slop disgradach, Gurhurig, Gach, Ain, Vulahul. The glad air marvelous stone. Or at least we started here and then we went to, to Stockholm. Um, I'm going to talk about the editing of the book now and about the putting together. This is the hard part. Tell us when you're tasked with a job like this, where do you start? Uh, Rick, 
It, I wouldn't describe it as the hard part. It was certainly a challenge, but it was an enormous joy and a tremendous privilege for me as someone who had just recently started in the department um, to be assigned such a wonderful task. Um, and as someone who had previously worked as a historian to be able to employ my research skills and then to have the pleasure of reading some of the finest work that has come out of this island in the last hundred years and bring it all together. Um, so how we started was um, the, the kind of core team of us um, those who are lucky enough to have our name on the front of the book, Ragnar, Helena and myself, but also um, Niall, former Secretary General, and Eugene Downs and the Culture Unit and a few other colleagues as well, um, just uh, sitting down, putting our heads together and saying, OK, who can think um, of who's produced the most tremendous creative writing and who's got an affiliation with the department? And there were some of the really obvious names um, and names who people will recognise when they read through the table of contents. But then as we started to dig deeper, and um, I started out with um, some of the go-to resources that a historian might use when they're charged with a task like this, like the Dictionary of Irish Biography, which is now available freely online and a brilliant resource for everybody. Um, but literally looking through um, to see who had a diplomatic career and who may also have happened to publish something, searching through the National Library, the National Archives, Trinity College Library um, and so on and just putting together this enormous spreadsheet with several hundred lines in it and uh, then working down from there, categorising these works into genres and realising the wealth of material we were dealing with. And that's how we ended up with three editors. So I worked mainly on the non-fiction writing and uh, Ragnar worked mostly on the, po the prose and fiction and Helena uh, worked mostly on the poetry. So we were able to kind of employ our own, uh, our own passions outside of work. It means in essence you're creating your own database of these writers because none exists prior to this. That's true, yeah, and I actually hadn't thought about it that way, um, that in, a se in essence in some ways we were creating um, a resource in some respects. Um, and really um, it was the most astonishing thing to see the amount of um, drama in the early years, um, the amount of different genres that individual writers worked in, and then to kind of decide, do we represent this person best through their poetry, through their prose? And then of course, as Niall mentioned earlier on, all of these people alongside this were producing um, the most astonishing diplomatic reports and official texts, but we made a decision early on not to include those, not least because there's already a wonderful um, formal history research project called the Documents in Irish Foreign Policy that is producing edited collections of those and I think they're up to the 1960s now. Uh, so that's another resource that's available for, for people who are interested in the official writing that comes out of the department. I know a few people who um, have put together anthologies of roughly this size and scale and um, one of the things they've, they've always had is that moment at some point where they think that they've just taken on this insurmountable task primarily because it then becomes a question of what you leave out and as you said yourself what what you choose to represent each writer with tell us maybe a little bit for people who don't necessarily understand how that works about how that process worked for for you and your fellow editors certainly it's painful to set aside some of your darlings <laughs> you know um, so we did um, have some quite long conversations and very long meetings um, into the dark hours on some winter nights um, we started out with the opinion that the book might be 300 pages long. It's now weighing in at, you know, um, well over that. I think it's about 400 odd pages. Um, we had to think about the spread across the chronology, first of all, because it's a centenary project and we were keen to ensure that there was representation throughout the history of the department. Um, and that, of course, then um, kind of threw up some interest in observations about the sorts of genres that people were writing in at different times. And so there's the wonderful satire by Aymar O'Duffy of the 1920s that I think as well has been in danger of being forgotten and is just kind of slowly re-emerging um, in the last few years with some new additions of the work and now thankfully with another chance and uh, to shine a light on that work again and then as you come further in um, to the later 20th century you see more and more women's voices being represented and in some of the really daring short fiction by people like Kate Slattery for example so it was really interesting to observe the chronology over time we were also really keen to make sure that um, the breadth of genres that people were writing in was well represented so we have a few uh, excerpts from dramatic works uh, one by Connor Cruz O'Brien 
Ryan. We have satire, poetry, fiction, short prose, and of course, non-fiction across history and um, eyewitness kind of reportage pieces. We were keen to make sure we had a gender balance that actually ended up being um, a work of mining across the extended diplomatic family. And we were so, um, I think, fortunate to be able to include writers like Siobhan and the other extended diplomatic family that give so much life and breath to our embassies abroad and you know, those family members for hundreds of years and um, before we even had our own embassies abroad were contributing to the establishment of those uh, embassies, networking, building the relationships and doing all the kind of back of house work um, that was not paid um, and not acknowledged formally. So we were really glad to have an opportunity to include those names and voices here. Tell me, as part of that process, do you then end up finding things that run thematically throughout decades and through the writing of different writers? Was that something that you came across? Absolutely. Um, the interpersonal relationships and how diplomacy is, I feel, at heart about um, the, the, the negotiation of those relationships, um, the understanding of those relationships. Richard put it so well with his reminiscences of that wonderful dinner party. I felt that I was there listening to your evocative description, um, and how it's all about language and nuance um, and appreciation for the written word that uh, Niall spoke about as well at the beginning, and that respect for language and that reverence for how we communicate and that precision as well, and sometimes being an intentionally imprecise and how valuable uh, the difference is between those two things. I wanted to ask you about that because you talk in the introduction about the nature of ambiguity and about both its use in diplomacy and about how that then becomes a very useful skill in something like either poetry or any kind of creative writing. Maybe tell us a little bit mm, about that. I think that's true and I think there's it's no coincidence that poetry is so well represented in the volume for that reason and for reasons like uh, Richard and Niall have described already. Um, that that creativity and that um, being able to speak to several people at one time as a diplomat is such a valuable tool and I think one that translates really well back into poetry. Um, there's also the importance of being able to be direct when it's necessary to. And I think um, one of the outstanding pieces for me, and I was so pleased when Niall mentioned it, was the Vinci piece. And I remember I got a shiver down my spine the first time I read that and couldn't believe as someone who had previously worked as a historian, I had never come across that piece of writing before. It's so masterful, it's so direct and unflinching. Um, so I think there are great contrasts between the pieces that we selected in the book for um, that uh, the value of ambiguity and the value of knowing when to, when to not flinch and when to own something. You might spotlight as well for us just a little, and, and you've mentioned it, the, the kind of on the ground reportage work that goes on as part of this, because there's, there's a fair amount of that here as well, and some of it's extraordinary. Mm, I think um, the piece that jumps out, jumps immediately to my mind when you mention that, um, are Joe Hayes' reflections on um, being in Chernobyl, uh, or being in, in Moscow at the time of the Chernobyl accident. And um, that was a piece that was written for Sunday Miscellany. It's short, but I think it really captures that moment. And it was something that spoke to me personally, because like so many other Irish families, we hosted children who came through Aidy Roach's Chernobyl Children's Project. And there's that long tradition in Ireland of kind of reaching that hand across Europe. Um, of a friendship um, to other nations. Um, so that bit for me was really evocative. It was one I knew I wanted to include the moment I read it. Um, we're almost reaching the, the end of our discussion here, but maybe just before we do, I want you to talk about the book itself, about the physical presentation of it, because the, one of the conversations that was happening before we started all of this tonight was, it's a terrible shame that we don't have all of the people watching tonight the ability to see just what a beautiful book it is. Yeah, thanks so much for bringing that up because I want to pay tribute to Paula McGlynn's cover art first of all. We gave her um, a really um, imprecise brief and she translated somehow our ambiguous and imprecise words on that brief into something really, really beautiful on the page. Um, so we want to thank her for that. And then Ireland House have done the most wonderful job and um, with producing a really high quality um, publication. And if anyone would like to get a copy, they can get it through Molly or Books Upstairs or several other regional bookshops. That's always good to get in at the end. That's kind of <laughs> vital and it's important. And it's the sort of book that makes a fantastic Christmas present for somebody you know in your life um, who, who likes reading or even 
written somebody who's interested in the non-fiction sections um, of it uh, as well. Um, before we finish up here tonight in Molly, you are going to introduce our final video of the night first. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce this video for everyone. Um, so sadly, uh, one of the great contributors to the book, Moira Rakanti, um, um, died last month. So we wanted to pay special tribute to her here this evening. Um, Moira is best remembered as uh, revolutionising Irish language poetry, really. But before she became a literary legend, she had made history in another way. She was one of the first three women who were ever hired to the Department of External Affairs, it was, as it was known at the time, uh, in 1947, along with Mary Tinney and Roisin O'Doherty. And Roisin's work is also represented in the book, Irish Language Writing for Children. Um, the film was shot in Ivy House, which is just down the street. And it's where Moira spent the early years of her career and where she met her later husband, Conor Cruz O'Brien, who is also represented in this book. And the poem Slán is read in this short video by five young female colleagues of my own who are following in the trailblazing footsteps of Moira and those two early colleagues of hers who really represent a revolutionary moment in Irish public service and in women's professional life in Ireland at a time where there were few women in the professions, when the marriage bar was still in play and there were few women in the civil service above clerical grades. So it's my honour to introduce this tribute to Myra now. Ma agam shislaan fada lap, a glau na chonik magaltachis. Let winter is let halte, feach, na bise brish the kriach. To hregen, to ma bin lam shin, na clair go rawa ro yin erm, nor to manish ko klitsha shin, is ko villid ert arish. Pe bulhara a ta in nam dun, pe counter in a dar load. Pay trave heart chun a glocky glum. Pay curum a ta rum. Ni er hrodna vlochlia, a rian me er a clin. Real higma swint a scapaha in yeveracht nihi. A her vuhig evad sheer, a rain the grain a bui. Duhig knuck is farga, no vetin cur umfree. 